Hello, travelers. Welcome back to Show and Tell with Reach the World. For over 20 years, Reach the World has used virtual exchange to inspire youth to become curious, confident global citizens. My name is Tim, and as part of Reach the World's efforts to support educators and families during the COVID-19 pandemic, we are sharing free live stream show and tell events with members of our global community. You can find an updated calendar of events and much more at athome.reachtheworld.org. For today's show and tell, I'm very excited to welcome Chelsea Howd. Chelsea is a United States Peace Corps volunteer who recently participated in a Reach the World virtual exchange, during which she shared her experiences living in Mozambique. And during her time in Mozambique, she learned a lot about special fabrics that are used in crafts and traditional clothing. And that's what she's gonna tell us all about today. To our live stream viewers today, welcome. Please be sure to let us know you're here and share any questions you have for Chelsea using the YouTube chat bar on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can in the next 25 minutes or so. And that said, and without further delay, I wanna pass it over to Chelsea. Hey, Chelsea. Hi, how's it going? Hello, fellow travelers. Thank you for um, inviting me here to speak with you today. <laughs> Yeah, we're happy to have you. Do you want to launch right into telling us about the fabrics of Mozambique? Yeah, so I have a little PowerPoint presentation with a lot of photos that I want to share. Um, and I also have some crafts and clothing with me that I can share after the presentation. So let me just jump right in and share what I have. Um, so here, the one moment. Okay, I'm not sure if you guys can see it. Can you all see it? Um, not still working on it. Okay, maybe it's still loading. Okay. There we go. All right. Let's jump in. Okay. So for this presentation today, I'm just going to share a little bit about my Peace Corps experience and a lot of things that I learned about the vibrancy of the culture of Mozambique, especially the fabrics, because I am just super excited to share those with you guys. Okay, so during my Peace Corps service, I served in a country called Mozambique, which is located in Sub-Saharan Africa. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the sector of health, which meant I usually went out and did health brigades. Um, I dealt with a lot of awareness for issues such as HIV, malaria, TB, and nutrition. So a lot of times when I went out into the communities, I was encouraged to wear capilanas. And capilanas are fabric that you see to the left and they come in um, many colors and many lengths. And normally they're kind of worn like sarongs. So you wear them like around your waist. And often when you wear those, it's considered a sign of respect. And when you went to venture into, com into the communities, um, you were viewed with respect if you wore these. So. Immediately, I was encouraged to um, uh, jump on this wagon and um, partake in Capilanas. And when I did, I actually learned a lot more um, about them. So on the history of Capilanas, they weren't originally from Mozambique. They were from India and they were brought over to Mozambique. So over time, Mozambique was exposed to like a lot of different cultures. Um, Mozambique was colonized by the Portuguese and eventually became independent. And so because of that, uh, Mozambique is really sort of a melting pot of many different influences. And so during my time of wearing these capilanas, as you can see, I wore them traditionally. And you can see a couple other photos where people had them made into different clothing. And the great thing about capilanas is you can have a lot of fun with them. You can wear them as accents to a shirt or a skirt. Um, a headband or really whatever. Um, in these photos, you can see different activities that I participate in the community. Um, you can see different conferences, award ceremonies, even weddings because Capilanas were often given as dowry before a marriage um, because oftentimes the, um, the father expected a dowry which is called a bolo. And so the Capilanas were very much important in that aspect. Um, and also to the bottom right, you can see uh, me and my fellow volunteers. We decided to take a capilana and use some designs. 
And also on the bottom left, you can see a lot of times women will use the Capilana for childcare because in Mozambique, you don't necessarily always have someone to watch your child. Um, you don't have a stroller. So what they would often do is take the Capilana and tie it around their shoulders and also carry babies. And this was very impressive because most of the time the women did not stop working. They ca imagine carrying a baby on your back and also carrying something on your head, normally like a, a bowl, which they call them basillas. And um, these basillas would contain maybe crops from an entire field or something that they would buy in the local market. So these women were superstars. So mm -hmm. I was very impressed by that. And the bottom lower, lower left picture that you see is women lined up to go to, um, to receive medicine from a pharmacy. Now, the next pictures I'll show you are some of the crafts that I started with my girls um, in my community. So my community, I failed to mention this, uh, is called Masika, and it's located in central Mozambique. It's very rural, um, and because of that, many families are um, very separated, and they largely keep to themselves, even with the community atmosphere. So um, the main main profession there is farming. So many times I would have to go out into the communities and visit families and um, recruit a little bit, uh, some of the girls into these clubs. And the purpose of these clubs was uh, to address health issues in the community and to help them make uh, healthy choices. And, but you know, the subject healthy choices is very boring. Who wants to talk about that? What we really want to do is play games and do crafts and do all sorts of fun things. So to get the girls engaged, we usually had them um, make earrings or other forms of jewelry. We have bracelets and necklaces and they had a lot of fun with that. In this picture, you see four girls, which is what we originally started with. And what we ended with was probably close to 20 girls, including boys too, because boys really do have that interest as well. Um, but that wasn't largely celebrated at that time. But yeah, here you can see some of the earrings and I can show you guys some of those later on. And in this next slide, you see some of the bracelets we also made. And so from a, um, from a typical hobby, this kind of transformed into sort of a savings group because older women also got involved because whenever we'd sell things at the market, other women would see us and like they would give the girls advice. And so that became uh, something bigger than I thought it would be. They um, became mentors to the girls and they also gave their advice about setting prices for the jewelry and like the crafts and stuff. And they would also help them save money and buy materials. And as you can see in the bottom right, you see some of the boys joining in and um, some other girls watching as uh, Linda creates, I believe to be a purse. And then the bottom left, we also started making pads, reusable pads. And so another issue in the community is girls uh, missing school because of their menstrual cycle. Oftentimes when they start their menstrual cycle, um, they're encouraged by their family to stay home because the bathrooms in the schools aren't really sanitary and they don't have really anything to use for this purpose. So they, they miss school. And um, because of this, a lot of girls drop out. Now what we started doing was creating some pads that you see in the lower left corner, um, giving some out and then later selling them. And if you guys are interested, I also have um, a link to a tutorial for that at the end. Some other uses that we had for our crafts with the Capilana fabrics included earrings, um, which you see in the top left, we have um, some hoop earrings. They were thick hoop earrings and we just used the Capilana fabric and just wrapped them around. And you can also do that with uh, bracelets, pulsatas as they call them. And um, also you can see with the necklaces, they would kind of sew a tube of fabric and place rocks inside the fabric um, to rocks or beads uh, to create that sort of effect and like maybe um, use like tie dividers between the rocks or the beads to create sort of um, a style in itself of Capilano. That was really cute. And they often would sell rugs as well. Um, as you see in the bottom left corner, we have um, a little wallet that one of the girls was making. 
And in the bottom right corner, you see uh, coasters and they also served as like pot, uh, what you set like a pot pot on. Um, and they're made with um, the tops of bottles, what uh, the kids would normally collect. Um, a lot of like beer bottles and um, soft drink bottle caps would be like left outside of restaurants and kids would collect them and play with them. So what we started doing was taking Capilano fabric and covering them and then gluing them together. And that became really popular as well. And I've actually seen that in a lot of places. So it's not just exclusive to my site. Um, a lot of people love, love these Capilano crafts. Okay. And that concludes my presentation. I know I didn't delve too much into how the crafts were made, but if you have any questions regarding that, um, I'd love to share that as well. Great, yeah, that's a great segue. I wanna encourage, we have a great group of, of live stream viewers right now. Please add your questions to the live, live stream chat and we'll pass them along to Chelsea. I have lots of questions I can ask in the, in the meantime. Um, I'm really, I think it's awesome to see that there's a degree of um, reuse of materials, found materials, um, like the bottle caps. Um, are there other examples of that that you can share? What a neat um, addition. Yeah, so I actually have some examples I can maybe hold up to the screen. Um, not only did the girls use bottle caps, they also used um, maybe cardboard pieces, um, anything that would give like an earring or a piece of jewelry, sort of a stiff backing. Um, here, let me pull out some that I can show you right now. Okay. So these were the first pair of earrings that we made with bottle caps and they were very popular in the community. Um, and eventually the girls started using um, cardboard uh, pieces that they found. Normally like trash is thrown off to the side and then they would just sew fabric over the cardboard pieces. They would cut out the cardboard into like little shapes. Some were diamonds, some were ovals. Um, they got really creative with this. And um, yeah, we had a lot of fun with it. And this is something that anyone can try at home as well. If you wanna do a little DIY while you have the time. Yeah, that's really great. Um, let's see, well, and besides that, well, it's not really a capital on a craft, but it's a craft in itself. Um, also, these bracelets were made, they were very popular. I'm making with shells and beads, yeah. I love the fact that these these look like things that students or people who are watching today could try on their own. Um, that you mentioned that there might be some tutorials or some directions for making those that you have. Yes, yeah, so I have a couple links. Um, I have a couple links in the next window. So if anyone has any questions, I can always send the links out um, as well. If anyone would like to, um, I, I don't know if I, I can do this, um, purchase from a Mozambican vendor, um, like maybe original fabrics. Um, I could also encourage that as well. Very cool, that was gonna be my next question. How can, um, how can we support? Right, so uh, when the COVID crisis first struck, uh, Mozambique was not prepared for it because um, I guess unlike Unlike a couple other countries, um, Mozambique didn't really have um, a sort of emergency plan. Um, and also Mozambique was not prepared with a certain uh, required number of tests to, um, I guess, ensure that the virus uh, was kept under control. And so because of that, um, a lot of people were just forced to stay in their homes and a lot of businesses were um, ground to a halt. And most of the economic prosperity in Mozambique is solely dependent on vendors on the streets and selling crafts. Crafts are a major source of income in Mozambique. So um, this really took a hit for them. So if anyone could support them and do what they can, yeah, I'd love to support that. Great, yeah, if you have the names that, that we can share, um, we can add it to the, the comments of the, the YouTube video. Um, and we can certainly share it with anyone who's interested. Um, I'm curious about just you personally and your voyage and journey to Mozambique and you really 
can you just tell us a little bit more about how you became interested in being a, a Peace Corps volunteer and how that came about? Yeah, sure. Um, so before Peace Corps, I actually saw a couple ads on TV and I heard a couple um, ads on the radio as well about serving and gain, uh, gaining valuable experience abroad. And at that point, I had never been abroad. I never traveled anywhere. Um, Mozambique is actually my first country that I visited. So in uh, filling out my application, I thought that I would expand my horizons, probably like most travelers thought they would, and also get to work towards um, a worthy cause. And so my Peace Corps experience took about a year um, to complete in total. Uh, it was a very long year. And um, upon that um, completion, I also did three months of training. And in that three months of training, you also learn the language because in Mozambique, the official language is Portuguese. Mm -hmm. So upon that, uh, before that time, I had never known a second language. I only spoke English. So that was also another challenge um, for me when um, reaching my community was also um, addressing that language barrier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What were what were some of the just amazing highs or, or great experiences that ha, came out of your time in Mozambique and what were some of the challenges? So I think my most memorable experiences uh, in Mozambique were times where I was with my community and doing something that I originally thought was insignificant, but um, which actually proved to be um, fundamental and um, in creating that sort of uh, bond and rapport with the community and actually starting to recognize that my community was a second home. Because when you go there, you're so work oriented and you think that you need to do X, Y, and Z, but it's really about making friends and it's really about getting to know people in the community. And something about Mozambique that I really love is that people have a sense of community that I have, I've never seen before. They, um, Everyone will constantly knock on your door. Um, everyone always cooks an extra uh, plate or two of food for you. Um, as soon as people hear that you're sick, everyone comes to visit you. Um, because phones are used, but normally people don't necessarily have the money to afford um, plans for them. People will just go and visit you directly. And that sort of face-to-face -face communication uh, was very different for me because I, I was just sort of like a send like a, a message, maybe like a message a day, like I'm here or I'm going or send or shooting a call to someone. But for them, like the face to face communication was very important and like the sense of community and knowing that you had a family to back you up um, in case of any sort of minor crisis, which for me could be a, a roach in my house or it could be like a, a little leak in my roof. Um, my, my family, my, I lived with a family while I was there and neighbors would always back me up and would always help me out. And they did that for everyone. And I thought that was amazing. You had a really unique opportunity to connect with your community in a really meaningful way and, and get involved in a way that people who visit a place for just a short period of time don't often get the chance to do. And I'm wondering what that process was like for you when you arrive in Mozambique uh, what is it like to become integrated into a community? So for me, I didn't really understand what integration meant um, until maybe after the first year that I was in my community, because when I first arrived, I had a sense of how to, well, I knew how to speak Portuguese by that point, but um, there were so many nuances and all these subtleties of the culture that I did not understand yet. And that was something that I um, internalized later on while I was in my community. But for me, um, integration meant not only knowing the language, but understanding the motives um, behind others in the community. Because um, especially Mozambican culture, it, it's, it's, um, it's not like, it's unlike a, the US culture. Um, 
because time there, it often moves much more slowly and people appreciate uh, time with their family. Like if, for example, if you were to go to work and you were to see someone on your way to work, you would be expected to stop and speak to them for at least 20 minutes. Um, in the US that would not happen. You would say, hey, I'm late for work, see you later. But in Mozambique, um, interactions were uh, valued very highly. Mm. And the time that you spent with someone was remembered. So I think in Mozambique, it took me a while to adjust to this sort of slower way of living. I don't know if slower is the word, uh, is the proper word to use in this instance, but it's um, more sort of a community atmosphere that values the time that you spend with someone rather than the productivity that we consider to be valuable here. Okay, well, what was it like for you? I know um, you spent quite a long time in that community and then had, came back to the United States in the midst of the COVID-19. What was the transition back to the United States like for you? So the transition for me um, was, I guess like, I, it, it was a blur um, because I was not expecting, it didn't feel real. When I said goodbye to my community, I had less than 24 hours to pack my house and to visit all of my friends and family. And they were all convinced that this would uh, blow over in a week. And um, I, I had um, no inkling of how long this would last. So when I said my goodbyes, um, I didn't expect it to be a permanent goodbye. But when you leave a country, um, you're faced with the reality of wondering if it will be the last time you'll ever see uh, these friends and these people who you never would have met in any other circumstance. But now you consider them to be vital um, in your life because they are family. So it was something that I didn't quite process because the journey back home was so quick. Um, our plane flight was like tw a little over 24 hours. I was back in the US and at that point, I had to consider um, would I file for employment? Would I uh, apply for another job? I, I had to think practically. And so when I was alone with my thoughts, um, I would um, just revisit all my memories. And you know, the, the time zone difference is also a factor because in the US, we're seven hours um, behind Mozambique. So a lot of times when I'd reach out to my family and friends, I couldn't speak to them until, um, possibly much later in the day for me. So uh, that was also, it was just something to, um, just another adjustment because I feel like after Peace Corps, uh, everything else is doable. It's just a matter of um, taking the necessary steps to make sure that, um, I don't know, you're using the right coping skills and <laughs> being resilient. Resilient was um, a key factor in this. Yeah, um, how do you think this whole experience has changed you or, or has it changed you in some ways? Yeah, I, I think it's changed me a lot. So before I left for Peace Corps, like I said, I never traveled outside of the country and um, I'd never been exposed to those certain perspectives. And when um, I heard that I'd been stationed in Mozambique, I, I honestly had never heard of Mozambique before that day, um, before my um, posting. Um, and I think in the, maybe in US education, we're often tempted to um, lump Africa together as one continent instead of looking at all the countries separately and individually as their own cultures. So when I traveled to Mozambique, I just had all these expectations of what I would see and that just wasn't it. And um, honestly, it was just, a, it was a relief to be wrong. And it was um, just really exciting to see uh, a culture that was unlike anything I had ever experienced. Like, um, I guess I sort of, ex I sort of in a safari, like maybe a desert. I don't know. There's all these stereotypes out there, but um, when you actually go and you meet the people, um, they're just so relatable and down to earth, and you just like wonder why you had all these um, preconceptions to begin with. Hmm, fascinating. Do you have the ability to, to keep in touch with your friends in Mozambique now? Uh, yes, so WhatsApp is very widely used in Mozambique and also the surrounding countries as well. Um, well, as far as I know, I think WhatsApp is very popular in um, Europe as well. But um, because of this, I often um, get in touch with my Mozambican friends. Um, 
like I said, the time difference may not be there or, or maybe off a little bit, but um, we can also, we can always stay in touch. Oftentimes we send each other pictures or videos saying like, I'm thinking of you. Um, or a lot of times they like to keep me up on, up to date on the coronavirus crisis in Mozambique um, and just what they're doing to stay safe. Yeah, it's just, you know, like the little things. Um, for me, it's just about also uh, brushing up on my Portuguese because mm -hmm. <laughs> um, while I'm here, uh, I'm not necessarily uh, being exposed to that language as much. And so when I'm hearing it, it's always, it's kind of a shock now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, you have to find some way to, to speak Portuguese with, with somebody in the United States. <laughs> right, I have to get that practice in. If you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so beyond um, your amazing work with crafts and, and really these beautiful fabrics in Mozambique, were you a part of any sort of other or witnessed any other traditions that you found really exciting or interesting? Yeah, so um, while I was there, as you know, I worked in a health clinic, um, but one of the first uh, rituals that um, they informed me of was at the beginning of summer or before the rainy season, um, there would also there would be a ceremony um, and maybe some dances to accompany uh, the the rains that would come. And they believe that if they did not perform uh, the this ceremony and this ritual, um, that the rainy season would not come. And so there were also um, certain ceremonies regarding. Um, coming to manhood or coming to womanhood um, in the community, such as when you turned 13, oftentimes uh, you would have sort of a rite of passage in the community. And um, I became aware of these ceremonies. Unfortunately, I didn't attend any. Um, I was very aware of them. And funerals, I learned, were often week long, um, where the family would mourn for their loved one. But after the week was up, they were um, they were then subjected to silence. They were not allowed to speak about their loved one or to show any grief or mourn. So I found that interesting that they gave themselves a period of a week to sort of release uh, any pent up grief that they had and then to um, sort of um, become stoic and to kind of like um, put it away for, uh, themselves as they moved on. Wow, how interesting. I wonder from your perspective to, to all the kids who are watching this live stream and who will be watching the recording of this video after the fact, what advice would you have if, if you're, you're a young person now and, and wants to follow in your footsteps and have a, a really you know life-changing international experience like this for themselves? Hmm. I, I think the best advice that I can give is, um, well, first, anyone will tell you to dream big, but um, I also think that if you have an idea of where you would like to go, I think that there um, are a lot of great resources out there that you can get in touch with. Um, I think that um, just having the sort of traveler spirit um, naturally makes you a more open-minded person and a person that's maybe uh, more willing to learn about um, maybe other uh, political atmospheres or um, other cultures or other um, or other practices. Um, and in that sense, I would tell you to um, perhaps um, I guess consider options like the Peace Corps. There are many alternatives to the Peace Corps, but I just found Peace Corps to be the best fit for me. And in that sense, I just think that, um, I don't know, try it. It's, uh, it was a ter it, I mean, originally it was a very terrifying experience for me, but I say that in the best possible sense because I think exploring the world is very necessary. And I think before I left the US, I didn't realize um, how necessary it was to be exposed to other perspectives, because in my mind, I thought that, well, we have the internet and we can watch videos, but it's really not the same because when you travel to another country and you experience it firsthand, there is that um, extra, per there's that extra empathy factor that you glean from that that you wouldn't from a video. 
Um, yeah, and I think there are a lot of um, misconceptions about countries in Africa because of videos like that, because they try to elicit sympathy rather than trying to understand why um, certain facets are in place and why people behave the way they do. And I think that traveling would give you a greater understanding of that. Well, that's such a great perspective, Chelsea. Thank you so much for joining us. I, 30 minutes have flown by. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. And if you want to send me the, the link to um, that viewers can, can go check out um, to learn more about Mozambique fabrics and, and crafts, I'd be love, happy to post those in the comment section of this YouTube recording when it's up. I just want to thank you again for joining us. This has been so fascinating. Thanks to our entire YouTube live stream audience for joining us today. You can join us again for a full lineup of amazing live stream events this week. There's several more to go. And there's a complete list of upcoming Reach the World live stream events at athome.reachtheworld.org. Thank you, Chelsea. And thank you so much for having see you me. See you later. All right. Bye.